We're in John chapter 3, and in a moment we'll look at verse number 16. But uh, I'd like to explain that this is the first part of a series we're going to have on how God loves and hates man and how man loves and hates God. Several things before we even read a verse of Scripture, and that is, this is the most basic doctrine in the Word of God. There is none more important. There is none more bottom line than this particular doctrine. This is what it's all about. Doesn't matter what other teaching that you go to in the Word of God, this is uh, actually where you can uh, go back, you can trace its roots all the way back to this particular concept. That God actually loves man, and at the same time, he doesn't love all men. And uh, we need to understand that. Simply because if you go to other churches, they emphasize the so-called love of God uh, to the exclusion of his judgment, his wrath, his hatred, and so forth. And so people get a lopsided view. Now, I realize that you can emphasize the hatred of God as well, uh, his uh, stickler for righteousness, and uh, completely overlook his love. But the problem is, you need to understand that unless you do something to get in his love, well, I thought his love was unconditional. Is it? Uh, he loves everybody the same. How come people are in hell? Uh, how come he says in his word that he hates certain people? Uh, there are conditions to the love of God, and we're going to see that. And then we're going to see that there are people who live who do really do love God. What is that? What does it mean to love God? Is it to gush emotionally and say, oh, I love God? Or is it something more to it than that? Uh, is it just a few cliches that you learn and memorize regarding how much God loves man? Or is it actually doing something in your soul that produces love? After all, the very first fruit of the Spirit is love. But you have to be spiritual then to have love. And that's the whole point. To have love for God is to be born again and to be spiritual. So as a person, you can love God, you can hate him, depending on certain conditions in your soul. Now, how, how important is it to know this? When well, John 3.16, it tells us that the whole world should know it because it's the means of everlasting life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God loves. But you'll also see in this verse that God hates. Those who don't believe perish. God sends to hell those who um, he hates. Now, how important is it for you? Turn to the book of Romans. Chapter 8. It's important for you to know that God loves, hates man. And it's important for you to know that man can love and hate God. Why is it important? Because Romans 8, 28. We know that all things work together for good. Now, if we were to stop right there and just simply say, oh, yes, and no matter what, God is going to bless you. Uh, and all the people of the world, God is going to bring together, and it's going to be his grand family, and he doesn't dislike anyone. Oh, no. All things work together for good to them that love God. See, there's the qualification. That's the stipulation. If you don't meet that condition of what really the love of God is in your heart, then uh, all things do not work together for good to you, for those who hate him. So you have to understand that this is a very, very important bottom line concept, and that if you miss it here, you miss 
the whole purpose of salvation, the whole purpose of redemption, the whole purpose of your life, and the whole purpose of a relationship with God or how to get one. Obviously, if you hate God, you don't have a relationship with, with him. And if you hate God, <laughs> eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, he's going to hate you back. Uh, that's, that's what it is. But if you truly love him and meet his conditions, he's going to love you. Now, uh, we'll get to seeing who loved who first um, uh, uh, during the course of this study, but you have to uh, um, set these, this, give this background first. All right, two more things regarding this. I believe that this particular subject is the most neglected and confused subject in all of Christendom. And thirdly, and this is a personal note, when I fully realized the implications of this love-hate relationship, the possibilities, the potential, it changed my ministry from one to simply giving a, a, a light, a milky type of, of challenge to people, trying to inspire them to live better for God, to one of depth and meat and understanding and, 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 and deepening and broadening the spiritual understanding regarding the things of the word. Why? Because Christians who are carnal, Christians who get challenged to get saved every week, um, are not those who love God. I don't care how emotional they get. I don't care how many file out of the church and say to the pastor, it was good to have been here because their emotions were stimulated. Oh, it felt good to be in the house of the Lord. Did it? Uh, what did you learn? How much of God's knowledge was imparted to your human spirit? How much of you it can you recall? Because that's the mechanism that by which you truly love God. Emotions are not the criteria for the love of God. Now, the problem with uh, this particular study is that, like with everything else, man comes to the Bible and tries to superimpose his understanding on it. And man loves other men emotionally. Now, that, that even there is a, is a false premise. Yes, we have an emotional involvement with people we care about, but that's not the reason that we should really love them. That's not why we should really love them. We should love them on the basis of compatibility of soul. I mean, if, here, if the person is an atheist and he hates God and he's in our family, do we love them? Well, come on. I mean, here, here's a Christ rejecter, God hater, vile person. Well, yes, we love them and care about them. But uh, if you allow them to draw you into the vortex of their, their vicious venom of hatred toward God, uh, then you're no better than they are as far as God is concerned. So uh, this particular business of loving uh, God and so forth is important. Now, in the book of Romans chapter 9, we need to see that the Bible teaches that it's possible for God, I better get a thicker pen here, it is possible for God Two, we'll put love on this side and hate on this side. Love and hate men. He's going to name them. Now, this one verse in uh, Romans chapter 9, verse 13, is going to dispel or should dispel all of the notions that everybody is goody-goody. God is an old man uh, sitting sentimentally on his throne, just up there waiting to bless everybody. Uh, and the, excuse the expression, the old codger's getting a little senile, and he's just tossing out blessings uh, uh, to anyone who'll come his way, and the flowers of his love are uh, sent, being sent down to the earth. Nonsense. Uh, you don't know the word of God. Uh, you don't know the angelic conflict. Uh, you don't know the hearts of men are deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. And uh, by the way, your heart and my heart was just like that before we got saved. And were it not for God, the Holy Spirit and his filling, our hearts are still that way. We kid ourselves. And of course, we studied that before. But verse number 13 says it's written, Jacob have I loved and Esau have I hated. Now, these were human beings. 
These are human beings that were alive on this planet just like you and me, uh, just like our loved ones and our friends. You see, just like everybody is either a believer or an unbeliever, everybody is either loved or hated of God. It's either or. Now, we can, uh, we can find out from this particular verse how God loves and hates. First of all, the word love over here is agapao. Now, this word means to consider or to regard based on the tendency of the will. All right? So when God looked at Jacob, he regarded him based on the tendency of the will. Now, what was going on in his soul that God looked at and considered and loved? It was the mental attitude of accepting what was going on in his heart. Now, what was going on in his heart? We've already seen by studying uh, our, our three characteristic um, uh, symbols here of man. Here's the human body. Here's the human soul. Here is the human spirit. Now, Jacob was not saved at one time. But what happened to Jacob? Well, the same thing that's going to happen to Esau over here. We'll see that in just a moment. But God the Holy Spirit came and in common grace gave him an understanding of God. We love him or we respond to him because he first loved us. Now, what did he do? In common grace, he gave us an understanding of himself. And when we say, God, I want to know you, I want to understand you more than anything else in, in my life. Now, of course, uh, Jacob, the tendency of the will here is to go all the way from gospel hearing to the age of, account uh, excuse me, uh, from God consciousness to the age of accountability to gospel hearing. And in every step of the way, God said to Jacob, boy, I like the tendency of your heart. You are responding to me. Now, response to God is loving him. But response to what, specifically? It's a response to his word. If you do not have a consistent response to his word during those times when you just simply do not respond to him or cannot bring his word forward, you must learn his word, you must know it. If you can't respond to his word, at that point, you do not love him. See, that's the issue here. You cannot love a God you don't know. And God sends his word to people. And based on how they respond to his word is whether he loves them or hates them. Jacob have I loved. Why? Because every time he gave him this understanding of himself, Jacob said, I want more. And God sent him just a little bit more. And Jacob said, oh, God, I want more. I'm beginning to see. I'm beginning to understand. And I desire to know you more than anything else. And finally, at gospel hearing, Jacob said, I believe. And it's that response where God and man come together. And it's at that point where um, God loved truly, in, in the full sense of the word, Jacob. But now, note verse number 13 again. It says, Esau... Have I hated? Here is the word, meseo. Now, this is simply the exact opposite of agapao. It means to consider, with reference to the tendency of the will, in rejecting. One is accepting what God says and responding. The other is rejecting and reacting. I'll not have this man to rule over me. I don't want what God has for me. And so God simply says, okay, that's fine. I'm looking into the soul of Esau right now, and I sent him a basic understanding, common grace of me. And every time I sent him a little bit of light, men loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. Esau is an evil man. He hates me, and therefore I hate him. Simple as that. Now, the importance of learning this is that 
you've been living your life on this false premise that God loves you because you're such a sweet and nice person. Oh, uh, you've just been so good that, that you just can't stand yourself. You look in the mirror and it's just uh, dripping with sugar and honey and everything nice and, and uh, so forth. And you go out and people like you and it's the hell fellow well met. Great personality. Uh, it reminded me the other day, uh, uh, John Kellogg, um, uh, Pastor Bill Kellogg's son from Mill Road called me up and wanted to know if we wanted to join in with their, their camp out of Camp Reveal. And I got to talking with him and said, well, no, we're sending our kids down to the Bill Rice Ranch this year, maybe sometime in the future, a couple, three years down the road. Maybe we can join you and, and so forth. I got to talking with him and I found out that he, he graduated from um, uh, the uh, Word of Life Bible Institute up at uh, Scroon Lake, New York. And that's where my friend Jimmy DeYoung uh, went. Uh, and uh, uh, he went down to Tennessee Temple, then went up there to teach. And Jimmy DeYoung was a real salesman. I'll tell you what, he could sell sand to an Arab water to a sailor. I, I never, but he's all mouth and he's real loud. And he, if he came into the room, everybody would turn because uh, uh, he makes his presence known. And everything to him is super and fantastic. Man, this is great. And he's, he's always trying to build up enthusiasm and stir things up and get things moving. And I was reminded of that because uh, this uh, Pastor John, the youth pastor there, every time I would say something, he would say, super. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. <laughs> Jimmy DeYoung revisited. <laughs> He's been re reincarnated, resurrected. He's not dead yet. But anyway, uh, what, does that, what does that matter? There are super salesmen that are unsaved. What, are they, what have they accomplished? They make the sale? Yeah. What, uh, what are some of these people trying to sell? They're trying to sell themselves, that they're really something other than what they are and try to stir things up, make things happen, get things. That's nonsense. It has to happen in your individual soul. If you don't have it, it's not there. No matter if some guy gives you an emotional message and causes you to get in your purse and in your uh, wallet and give. It's like the, the fellow Burklow uh, that's been in the news. Uh, you've been following that. I knew he was wrong when he would take some of these doctor's wives around to the various stores, and uh, we know of one, and uh, this guy would say to them, I want a uh, hundred pairs of sandals out with a credit card. Now, you know, uh, you don't have to have too much discernment to understand that this, this dude is not for real. He might talk a good ball game, but all he wants is a little bit of money to the tune of $205,000. But they thought that their giving this man money in this way was uh, showing their love for God. And again, it's nonsense. All right. The point is simply this. In your soul, you either love God by responding to him through the Holy Spirit and his word, or you hate him no matter what kind of false face you have on. Now, the point is this, that God reciprocates. That's a doctrine that we could apply here. Eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. Wisdom in the book of Proverbs says, I love them that love me. They that hate me love death. And that's what God does. So it's, it's plain and simple. It's black and it's white. All right. Now, one more thing we want to note about this particular concept here is that both of these uh, words are in the constative aorist. Now what the constative does, it takes a point and it looks down the road here to another point and uh, we talk about the duration of an action. All right? So here Jacob has come to the age of accountability and the duration of the action, every time he was brought to an understanding of the person of God. Every time God revealed himself to him, every time he gave just a little bit more of an understanding and his word, Jacob responded positively. And God says, I love him. That's the tendency of his heart, to want to know me through my word. Now, on the other hand, Every time God tried to get through the, to the duration or um, in the duration of Esau's life, Esau responded negatively. And that's how God viewed them 
And that's how he loved them. All right. Come back with me now, if you will, to the book of Exodus. Exodus chapter 20. And in verse 6, we're going to see how man loves and hates God. And again, this, this is a real good uh, test for all of us. Do I really love the Lord? That's a question you can ask yourself. Uh, does God love me? And immediately we want to say yes. Oh, we're just so good. Uh, and me, uh, we found out from Jacob and Esau that uh, God does not love mankind equally. He does not do it. It's based upon the action of your volition as to how God views you. Now, we're going to see an exception to the rule here in just a little bit with John 3.16. But after John 3.16... God says, here I've demonstrated my love to you, and you can see it at Calvary. But now, after that, I'm going to consider you on the basis of how you respond to my demonstrated love. You hate me, I'll hate you. You love me, I'll love you. It's plain and simple. Now, uh, because of the social bombardment we have in our liberal media, we tend to think that all people are good people, that they're all great. Then all of a sudden we see large segments of the world's population wiped out with a storm or an earthquake or a bomb or something. Well, isn't that horrible? We've got to save these people. Well, why did it happen to them in the first place? Because they hate God. Why, why does America go up and down with, with its economy? Why are there more poor? Why are there more unemployed? Because more and more collectively, they refuse to become part of the remnant. They refuse to, to either get saved or be spiritual. And what happens? God simply says, that's fine. You hate me, I hate you. And um, I'm going to reciprocate by sending hard times your way. Now that's not true of all hard times but it's a principle, it's a basic principle regarding uh, man's, uh, the reason for man's existence here and why God does certain things. I, uh, I was reminded of that uh, this past week because I uh, had lunch with somebody and we were talking about uh, certain things happening to certain people and even young ones and so forth. And the person who is not doctrinally oriented but uh, professes to be uh, a Christian said, I just don't understand why these things happen. And I bit my tongue because I wanted to say, if you would only come to church and learn Bible doctrine, you would understand. But those same things are going to happen to you because the more you hate doctrine, the more God hates you. Now, you might have a good life right now. Things might be, quote, hunky-dory, uh, and, uh, and uh, you might be in good health and, and your family and so forth, but it's coming. Judge, don't, it's appointed unto man once to die, but after that, the judgment. But sometimes Paul says in Timothy that the judgment comes before the, um, either the white throne or the bema seat. All right, Exodus chapter 20, verse number 6. He just said, thou shalt have no other gods before me. All right? He said in verse 4, not to make any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, earth beneath, or water under the earth. Don't bow down to them, nor serve them. For the Lord thy God is a jealous God. He first loved us. And when we spurn his love, scorn his love, reject his overtures of love, reject the fact that he has made provision for us, he simply turns it around and hates us. All right? Verse number six. And showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me. But now note the next phrase, and here's the answer. 
Here's the answer for your life. Uh, here's, here's the answer for why a pastor who loves his people has, um, has ridden the trail of attendance and faithfulness. You can't love God without knowing his word. If you've never learned it through the means that he provides for you, you cannot keep his commandments. You're out there in the workplace and s certain views come your way, viewpoints. You're, you're called upon for an opinion. You're called upon to do a certain thing. If you have no scriptural reserves, you fail right there. And where you get out of fellowship is the point where you start hating God. And by the way, that's the exact point where he starts saying, well, look, if you're not going to love me, I'm not going to love you. And he starts sending discipline your way. Now, I'm not saying that God is going to immediately, uh, immediately judge you in a very severe or harsh way, but he is going to start bringing to, to pass uh, certain pressures to bear to get you back in fellowship. Uh, but if you harden your heart, the more you harden your heart, the more he begins to dislike your life. Pauline, a verse of scripture concept, uh, they that are in the flesh cannot please him. How do you love God? It's through keeping his commandments. Verse number six, that's how man loves God. Keeping them as we saw though with the whole heart. The word love here is the word ahab. And it means literally to have a total affection for with the whole heart or perhaps more specifically, to be occupied with. Now we get this uh, uh, from this, this particular concept from um, uh, human nature, uh, a human happening, I should say. Not from the old sin nature, but a human happening. When... Uh, we're young and so forth, and all of a sudden we uh, meet uh, the so-called right person. What happens? <laughs> well, you become occupied. Uh, you, school loses its value. Uh, uh, your parents can't get anything uh, out of you by way of chores uh, because you're constantly thinking about this person. That's something that happens to young people around the, uh, uh, the sophomore age and so forth and, and onward. What has happened to that person? Well, they're occupied with another person. But in this particular case, the occupation comes with God. I want to know him. How do you know him? Through his word. And it's as you become occupied with his word that you become occupied with God. And occupation with God is loving him. You cannot love God emotionally. It must be, first of all, academically. You have to know him. And the only way you can know him is through his word. Now, on the other hand, it says in verse number five, I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God. Now, jealous is the, uh, the concept of God loving us and demanding our attention. But visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. Now, the word hate, sane, and it means, again, just, just the opposite. We had Maseo and Agapao. We have Ahab and Sane. And it means to reject totally. Now, we're moving into an era where there is going to be a renewed interest in family life. And to that, of course, we applaud. Uh, it's important to have good stable, solid marriages and families. Our society is built upon that. A church should be built upon that as much as possible. Uh, but because marriage and, and family are, families are being torn apart, uh, a lot of times you have many singles coming into churches now. Um, hopefully not to look for 
the right man or right woman, hopefully because you want God to send you that person wherever they may be located. If it's a church, that's fine. Uh, but if you're coming to church for that reason, that's the wrong motivation, I guarantee you. You come to church for one reason, to love God. I repeat, you come to church for one reason, to learn how to love God and then how to have proper relationships. And then God brings about those things to bear where all things work together for good to them that what? Love him. Oh, oh, that's the way it works. Yeah, you got to love him first. Then he brings it to bear. You love him first. Oh, now here's the point I was uh, making on families. We salute that, every effort to keep families and marriages together. We should. But here's the catch. We have a lot of religions today that emphasize the family. But know what it says, visiting the iniquity of the fathers unto the children of the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. Got a tight family, got a close family, oh do you? Uh, what did your father teach you about God? What did your mother teach you about God? Or when God came your way and said, look, I don't care what anybody else does. Yes, you're on, you honor your father and mother, but uh, you're not theirs. You're mine. And I give you an understanding of me to have a relationship with me. What do you do? What, what do you say to God? God, my parents are more important than you in my life. God, my spouse is more important than you in my life. Lord, my kid, oh, we've got to have a good family. So every weekend we're gone from church and my, because entertaining my kids is more important than getting them the knowledge of the word. I'm telling you that God visits that iniquity to them that hate him. You're not doing your kids any favors by keeping them out of church. You've got to get them there and get them there again. They fuss and fume. It doesn't matter. You stand up to them and you stand and stand for the Lord. <laughs> That's right. Uh, and I guarantee you it'll work. I guarantee you that when they're old, they'll not depart from it. Or they might stray for a little while, but you, you stand your ground for God. And when they're old, they won't depart from it. Otherwise, you as a parent are contributing to the hatred of God toward them and their hatred toward God himself. I don't need God. I can live my life apart from God. I don't have to believe in him. I can do it my way. Where'd you learn that? My dad taught me. My mother taught me. Oh, they had a good family, good marriage. We did everything together as a family. Yeah, but we never went to church together. We never got saved. And may I ask you a question? What good is a family like that? Yes, and family is important, but what good is a family like that? Where the very parents themselves give physical birth and lead them down a primrose path to hell and to, to be apart from God for all eternity. We need families that are built upon love for God, then a proper love for one another. And uh, we need to get that straight. All right. So that brings us then to John chapter 3, verse 16, and we're just going to read it and... Make a comment and come back to it, using it, it as our springboard for the well. I bypassed John and hit Matthew. Now I'm in Acts. Eventually, I'll I'll find my way here. John chapter three, verse number sixteen. Now again, uh, just before we read this particular verse and, uh, and end our time together, if there's somebody who misunderstands what I just said about the family, then, um, then uh, I'm sorry for you. I, I pity you. Of course, families are important. Solid marriages, devoted, committed to one another are important. And uh, we would applaud that. We would teach it. I mean, after all, we spent, what, about six months on RMRW, a right man, right woman. Uh, even then, you know, um, this interesting thing, I caught flack over that. Um, uh, the, 
right man, right woman concept, and yet it's taught in the Word of God. And people just simply do not understand. It came from uh, certain folks who don't want to be committed to their, to their spouses. Well, that's neither here nor there now. But you catch flack on that kind of nonsense. Uh, excuse me, on that kind of good doctrine. You, <laughs> theirs was the nonsense, not mine. Verse 16, and this is where we're going to take up in, uh, then in the after service. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Verse of scripture that you all probably know off by heart because most pastors quote this more than any other verse. <laughs> you would get it by road if you didn't get it by any, by any other means. Uh, and and uh, so anyway, you know this. But might I say that it doesn't say in the Greek what it says here in the English. As beautiful as it is and as useful as it is to us. Um, when we start in the after service, you're going to see that both the love and hatred of God are mentioned in this verse of Scripture.